Order! 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 You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! They are exhausted, they are disillusioned, they are in very bad shape. But they have finally escaped, rebel held Aleppo, the Red Cross says, after a convoy of buses and ambulances carried some thousand civilians out of the besieged enclave with more vehicles already on the way. But there was chaos this morning when an initial convoy came under fire, leaving several people hurt. We should warn you, there are distressing images in this report by our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman. <laughs> Threading their way through the rubble, 10 ambulances and some 20 buses, evacuating almost a thousand civilians from eastern Aleppo, taking them to relative safety but at enormous risk. Because yesterday's ceasefire collapsed and this one almost did the same when pro-government forces opened fire shortly after it began. A child waves goodbye to his ruined city. A man accompanies his prized birds, the most valuable possession he can carry. The UN is not in charge here, though the International Red Cross is monitoring and called this a positive first step. Early this morning, amid the sound of gunfire, our camerawoman, Wad al Khatib, filmed an injured man lying in a hospital courtyard, waiting for the evacuation to begin. Now the cars uh, is uh, full of civilians and the injuries, they are all uh, 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 will go. Packed in one ambulance are women and children desperate to escape. And Wad travels with them. We are waiting with the cars and uh, the civilians and the injuries and their families. Uh, now we are hearing uh, sounds of uh, weapons. We don't know what's happened now, but uh, actually all civilians and injuries uh, in their cars are afraid. This convoy has come under direct fire, so newly injured civilians are driven back where they've come from for medical help. طبعا المهم طالعنا ودينا جبنا ابو الاسعاف وهذاك لسه على ايده هنيك ما يشوف الا قالوا بي بس هن صاروا يبدوا قناص فلت 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 ما بقى تعرفي لا قناص ما بقى تعرفي طب هم ناسقين مو لازم يكون لا ما وافق ما وافق الاولاد يعني الا شوي كان الاولاد كمان راحوا كلياتنا كنا رحنا هي على اساس التنسيق Yet there is almost nothing left to live for here. So tens of thousands are preparing to undertake the same journey. Turkish officials predicting that 50,000 will leave in the next few days, assuming there are enough buses and that the ceasefire lasts. It's true, we're leaving Aleppo, this boy says. But when we grow up, we will come back and liberate it. Me, my brothers, all of us. Amid the devastation, a woman scrawls her farewell message. We're coming back, down with Bashar al-Assad. Syrian state television showed the official flag flying in the east of the city. Some pro-Assad militia would rather wipe the rebels out than let them escape. Though the president himself was filmed on a mobile phone outside his palace, saying history had been made. <laughs> Everybody's saying congratulations now, and all social media express the word congratulations. We do not want to repeat this word. I want to reassure you that what is happening today is history being rewritten by every Syrian citizen. 
The Russians who brokered this ceasefire say rebel fighters seen mingling with civilians here will also be allowed safe passage. Civilians arriving in rebel territory this afternoon weren't subjected to government ID checks or registration and Damascus may be happy to herd its enemies in one place, paving the way for another siege later. As for the opposition, well, judging from this video shot from a drone, they seem to know the real-life disaster movie that is Aleppo is almost over. President Assad may control only about a third of Syria, and hundreds of thousands lie dead, but this wasteland of flattened buildings is what he calls victory. So how is the world responding? Here, the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson has summoned the Russian and Iranian ambassadors to express what he described as profound concern. Earlier, I spoke to Stephen O'Brien in New York. He's the head of humanitarian affairs and emergency relief at the United Nations. After some civilians came under fire trying to leave East Aleppo, I asked him how far the UN would try to hold people responsible for what has happened there. Yes, we are also receiving reports of people who have been encouraged to go through corridors that have been set up by the combatant parties, so not by the UN, and we have not been consulted on those. And so as we get those reports, and as you hear my colleague, the High Commissioner for Human Rights Equally, uh, highlighting these reports, uh, whether it is to do with people being diverted from the corridors of exit or whether they're being taken to one side, uh, some allegations of torture, even some reports of executions. We need to see that there is evidence collected, gathered, preserved, and that these should be brought to a, a tribunal for accountability to be put in front of those who are alleged to have perpetrated these abominable potential war crimes. President Assad has just said what's happening in Aleppo today is making history. Well, I think it's making a very much a, a history which we would not wish to see. But at the same time, now we've got people in need who have the ability uh, to escape from the terrible depredations, fear and searing anxiety which they've been living under for so long. It's vital that we do everything we can to meet the needs of all those who've been caught up in this crisis through no fault of their own. Well, to what extent are you in any position to uh, insist on some kind of presence in and around Idlib if that becomes the new marshalling yard for these incredibly dispossessed and distressed people. And more than that, the Turks are talking in terms of a um, refugee camp uh, for anything up to 100,000 people. Will you have access to that? Well, we are discussing with the Turkish authorities, who have, of course, been uh, very uh, generous and have uh, enormous experience in establishing camps, uh, indeed in Turkey, just on the uh, northern border with Syria, and so this discussion for potentially a camp uh, in and around Idlib is important because it means that we can ensure not only that we have a place of safety but a place where we can get the services and that we can properly register people who have chosen to come to uh, Idlib. And yes, we do have people on the ground in Idlib in order to uh, ensure that people who have grave needs are uh, at least get, getting access to where those needs can be met, whether that's water or food or medical or psychosocial support. Uh, and in the camps, they're able to uh, try to reunite with their family members, those who've survived uh, this terrible onslaught. And this has been the tragedy of the whole disaster centred on Aleppo, that uh, at every turn, either the Russians or the Syrians or some other player has prevented the United Nations from having any seriously local active part in it. Since uh, November the 15th, we've not had any formal food supplies into eastern Aleppo. Uh, so that's over a month. People have been eking out what little they've got. Uh, we haven't had any uh, ability, despite for once in December getting our UN plan for distribution of aid agreed by the government of Syria, uh, because of these uh, ongoing security reasons, we've not actually been able to deliver on that or get in. And so for all the agreements we may be able to achieve, when we're prevented, we're prevented. And that does mean that people in need uh, simply either aren't able to survive or go hungry and are in terrible fear. Stephen O'Brien, thank you very much indeed for talking with us. Cheers, John. Thank you.